All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think this is going to work. Hopefully, Starlink will bless us with a solid connection today, but it will depend. It's a little overcast, but that shouldn't matter. The frequency should go through that. I hope you're all having as good a day as Tesla is right now because they just had their most profitable quarter ever. In fact, so profitable that even subtracting the electric vehicle credits, Tesla was still profitable. So that argument that... Um, people use against Tesla all the time are, is no longer capable of holding up is that, oh, they only are profitable because of the credits. Now, even if you subtract the credits, they still made a profit. Over $1.1 billion um, in profit in the last quarter, which is incredible. Um, auto gross margins of t over 25%, um, and that's excluding leasing. Um, so they've financially just had a wonderful quarter, best quarter yet, uh, but I, I don't mean to be, a, I'm having a great day as well, because for one, I'm happy Tesla had a solid quarter. And also, I just had some sushi and I went swimming at a friend's house. So it's just a good day overall. But I hate to be the Johnny Raincloud and focus on the bad thing. But they did, unfortunately, delay the Tesla Semi. Which, as you guys know, I'm a huge fan of the Tesla Semi. I want that thing to come out. And I was really, really bummed by that, because it means that... um. The Tesla Semi is officially the latest Tesla ever. It's it's later even than the Model X because they originally wanted the Semi to be produced in, at the end of 2019. And now it's not even going to be produced at the end of uh, 2021. So that officially pushes it to three years. But um, everything else seems to be running pretty well for them. Uh, there was actually some really, really good news that I wanted to highlight for uh, 4680s, which I should be able to. Yeah, here we go. Um, core technology up here with the uh, battery and powertrain section. Uh, so divert your attention to this section of the shareholder deck because this is the good news. Um, it says, we have successfully validated performance and lifetime of our 4680 cells produced at our Cato facility in California, which I've seen myself, and this is the same facility that was operational during battery day, and it sounds like that they've, you know, of course, uh, got the validation of them much, much better, and the reliability of them has improved. It says, we are nearing the end of manufacturing validation at Cato. Field quality and yield are at viable levels and our focus is now on improving the 10% of manufacturing processes that currently bottleneck production output. So this is great news because it means that, um, of course, they've reached a point where they're ramping enough 4680s and they're usable 4680s. And on top of that, uh, performance and lifetime means that how the how the batteries age, what's their cycle life is good, and that they're viable, which is also really really encouraging. And it's also interesting that they're they're using the term they're ending the manufacturing validation at Cato. So I'm hoping that still means Cato Road is going to keep making 4680s, except not just for prototypes, but also for fully fledged production. Um, but they did go on to mention, while substantial progress has been made, we still have work ahead of us before we can achieve volume production. So I'm assuming that means uh, they've got their little test facility running well and they've got a formula that they think works pretty well. But um, primarily, it's going to take probably until next year for 4680s to be produced at an insane volume to, to where it's actually in mass-produced vehicles. Um, but I, they, they still mentioned later in the, I think at the bottom here, that they believe uh, they're still on track to build uh, the first Model Y vehicles in Berlin and Austin this year. So they still have confidence that both Gigafactories will be working by the end of this year. Not being super precise about that timeline, but um, anyway, I'm just highlighting what I thought was most interesting. Um, where was that better? Oh yeah, I passed it here. Last bit of interesting news on the 4680, which I think is really, really good, is it says internal crash testing of our structural pack architecture with a single piece front casting has been successful. So that's part of the next generation. Um, that's part of the next generation of uh, Model Ys, which are both coming out of uh, Germany and Texas. Um, they're going to be using the single-piece front castings, which has not been used yet at the Fremont or Shanghai facilities. And also the structural battery pack has not been tested. Apparently it has been now internally, and it's been going well. So that that's another good sign for Model Ys of those two factories to be coming out by the end of this year. Um, I know a bunch of us uh, want, people, uh, want updates on the Cybertruck, and unfortunately... 
that's where I guess a little bit more bad news comes in because this installed annual capacity has not changed um, from the last quarter as far as I'm aware. I can't remember if the Shanghai production rate said over 450,000 or if it just said 450,000, but we still have Model Y for Berlin and Texas in the construction uh, rate. And I was really, really hoping that the Cybertruck would say construction as well because they even posted pictures um, down here. So this is how uh, Giga Berlin is looking right now, which is really great. Just in the background here, you can almost see the foundational work going in. That's where the 4680s for Germany are going to be built, um, which is good. They also gave us a sneak peek at this new paint shop. That's the thumbnail of this video, obviously, which I thought was really, really cool. Probably the, the neatest picture of the shareholder deck because this is the next generation paint factory that Elon has been talking about that um, has n extreme precision, really, really great quality control, and obviously they've wanted to have much, much better paint and more paint options as well um, for their vehicles, but because of the dated factory layout and the fact that Fremont and Shanghai pretty much have to be running at all times, they can't really afford to shut down the old paint shop, so really the only way they can implement a brand new one is if they and, and bring in some new manufacturing and painting techniques is if they build a whole new factory so that's what both um germany and texas are having um so that's what the inside of it looks like which looks you know pretty dang close to done um yeah this is uh giga texas now and they're still labeling it as model y factory construction which i find interesting because we're kind of aware of what um Tesla is working on in regards to wh what the layout of the factory is. Like, here's General Assembly, here's Body and White, and here's the paint shop, and over on uh, this... Oh, no, I'm looking at it backwards, sorry. This is the 4680 section, this little gray area. Um, the cell team even had, like, one of the steel bars that went in for construction. It was all signed for the... So we know that this segment of the factory is for cell production, and then I believe General Assembly... Um, is over here and this long strip is the paint shop and we know that this whole side that they're expanding currently this is all for Cybertruck at least you know it's not official from uh, Tesla but they did mention in this whole shareholder deck I think near the bottom oh there's the const uh, part of the construction crew for Giga Texas and here's the uh, body shop on the inside which is looking really good because we've actually got some build put together and you notice they don't have floors in them uh some people were pointing that out they these are waiting for their structural battery packs which is why um they don't have metal plates at the bottom but there are the single piece uh single piece front castings and you can see the body panels uh, at texas uh, the body robots and stuff getting ready um this is the stamping press this is also on the inside of giga texas so we always get all these construction updates from the outside of the factory these, that's why these shareholder updates are cool is because we can finally see the inside, which is very hard to get a hold of images of. Um, apparently, expansion is still going on at Giga Shanghai, although they didn't really specify exactly what it is. Um, near the bottom, I believe they... Or did I pass it? Oh, yeah. Photos are at the bottom. I keep forgetting. You'd think after I studied this thing right before we began. Okay. Um... Oh, this is pretty much the only update we got on the Cybertruck uh, from the shareholder deck. Again, when the earnings call starts, which should be in about 23 minutes, they might go into more detail or people might ask questions about the Cybertruck or the Semi and that type of thing, and they can go into more detail. Um, but it says, we are also making progress on the industrialization of Cybertruck, which is currently planned for Austin production subsequent to Model Y. So for those who don't know, subsequent means after. So Tesla is kind of directly shooting down Troy Tesla's uh, rumor that was floating around on Twitter that uh, Cybertruck production was going to start before Model Y. Um, never really made sense to me. I don't know why uh, they anyone thought that was going to be the case. It definitely is not. Um but here's, I guess, a more optimistic way to look at it um, at, the, at the expense of the semi. They said, to better focus on these factories and due to the limited availability of battery cells and global supply chain uh, challenges, we have shifted the launch of the semi-truck program to 2022. That was probably the worst news I got today because I was really, really hoping the Tesla semi would not push the boundaries of how late a Tesla vehicle could be. And unfortunately, that's what they did. Um because they originally said production would be 2019. Um, and when they say 2022, you know, I, I honestly, I kind of doubt that even means quarter one. I don't think that means quarter two. 
Uh, they're not saying early 2022 or anything like that. Um, I think that the majority of their focus with 4680s is just going to be on Model Y, and then once Model Y is ramped, Cybertruck after that. So because of all those issues, I, I have to imagine the Tesla Semi is probably not as close as I was hoping. Um, it certainly makes me question um, electrics sources. There have been several people contacting, you know, Sawyer Merritt and Electric saying that, you know, pilot production for uh, pilot production for the Tesla Semi is going to be done at Giga Nevada and it's really close and drive axle production is done and they're going to get really, really uh, close to ramping Tesla Semis in the next couple months. Um, where is volume production of the Semi occurring now? There isn't any. Um, they're not launching the Tesla Semi this year is essentially what they're saying at all. Um, I guess there's a chance that maybe the only scenario at this point where I could imagine that electric sources and Sawyer Merritt sources are accurate, which um, there have been several leakers, I guess, all alluding to the fact that there's a pilot production line uh, at Giga Nevada where they're going to produce like five Tesla semis a week. That's been the number that's been floating around for a while. Um but ultimately, I think Elon said in a, in a previous earnings call that they eventually want to build the semi at Giga Texas. I have no clue where, because the factory is already packed for Model Y and Cybertruck production, so they might have to build a whole new facility just for the semi. Um, but I've, I've heard several, uh, several times, I believe, Tesla has stated that, or at least Elon has stated that they want Semi to be done at Texas, ultimately. But there were a lot of sources saying that they would at least start it at Giga Nevada. The only way I could see it happening now is if maybe all of the Semi trucks uh, that Sawyer Merritt and Electric were hearing about through their sources are just going to be used for Tesla, and they're not going to deliver any Semi trucks to actual customers. Um, which is a bit of a bummer, but I would still be excited because I, more than anything, I don't exactly care where the semis are being used or who has the Tesla semis. I just want more heavy duty diesel semis taken off the road. So if that involves just Tesla being the company that uses the semi this year and no third parties get to use them, no customers get to use them until next year, I would still be excited for that, but that's like, that's probably too much wishful thinking on my part. It's likely not what we should expect. If they're saying they've shifted the launch of the semi-truck program to 2022, that probably means there's not going to be any semis until uh, next year. Um, but it's ne it's never a good sign. You know, I critique startups for doing this, and I'll also critique Tesla for doing this. But they have now delayed the semi-truck several years in a row, um, and they keep just pushing it back, pushing it back, pushing it back further. Um, which is not encouraging, especially when they said it would be 2019, and then they said it would be 2020, and then 2020 came along, and they said actually 2021, 2021 came along, now they're saying 2022. It's just, it, it doesn't ensue confidence in the product, and it definitely gives a lot of Tesla haters um, reasons to hate at them and say like vaporware or Tesla doesn't deliver on their products, and they said these things would be out that we're going to be in, in the probably first and second quarter of next year, and people will be able to say the Tesla Semi is like three years late, uh, which is not good. You, that's that's later than even the Model X was. So that means Tesla Semi is officially the latest Tesla. I mean, it, it's taken the longest for them to get that out. It was unveiled in 2017, and they're saying not they're not going to launch it until 2022. But, you know... It's not like a make-or-break product. It's not like a, a vehicle that Tesla really, really needs to get. I mean, I think they need to get it out soon, and I think it's important for their mission statement, but I understand that most of their focus is probably on higher-volume vehicles like the Model Y and the Cybertruck because they know the semi is low-volume, and I, I just... I, I think it ultimately is probably coming down, of course, to the batteries... And in the early days of 4680 production, I bet it's not exactly cheaper. And the Tesla Semi needs batteries to be ramped up at high volume so that they can afford to ship really, really giant battery packs inside the Tesla Semi, which sounds like an expensive vehicle. But if you consider the, the size of the batteries, it's really not that expensive at all. In fact, it's incredibly cheap. Um, so... <sighs> 
like if you think about the fact that the the longer range Tesla semi is probably going to need like uh, 800 kilowatt hours or or close to a megawatt hours worth of batteries in it, um, and they're selling it for like two hundred thousand dollars. That's you know ten time. To- it's like ten Model S batteries in one product. That's the price of two Model S's or pla- or less than two model Plaid Model S's, um, a, a little bit more than two long range Model S's. So finding a way to sell that vehicle profitably is probably fairly tricky. I think they can do it, um, but they're probably just going to wait for 4680s to be at a high enough volume. Um, and like Tesla said in their own uh, shareholder deck here, the, the 4680s aren't at a high enough volume yet for probably what they want the semi to be. Um, the problem is they need to let people repair the vehicle if they're going to buy a semi truck. Well, the thing about the semi truck is it needs substantially less repair than any current existing semi truck because you have no brake pad replacements to worry about. You have no oil changes. You've got no windshield braking to worry about because it's Tesla armored glass. Substantially less parts than a diesel semi truck. So there's there's less repair overall. I don't think the repairability is the main issue holding back the semi. Um, it might be a tension point for some customers, but there's clearly a ton of huge companies that have reserved um tens dozens if not hundreds of tesla semis at this point they want the product and uh, they're probably well aware that tesla is not super uh right to repair focused um so i don't think that's the issue i think it's a battery pack thing the roadster could be as late or even later the roadster's not super late yet um when the roadster was unveiled they said it would be out in 2020 so it's technically one year late and then next year it'll be two years late, which is not unheard of for Tesla. The Model X is one of the latest ones they had. They said it would be out in 2013, and it wasn't out until 2015. So Model X was two years late. Roadster could easily be two years late. Um, maybe the Roadster ends up being three years late, but that's that that would mean that the Roadster doesn't come out until 2023, which I guess is possible. But if the Roadster's not out, if the Semi's not out next year then it will still have the Roadster beat. Um, Let's see. I think the Roadster version 2 will definitely be the most delayed Tesla of all time, considering they have that as their lowest priority right now. They do, but I think that's fair. Um, uh, The Tesla Semi, I understand why it's not the top priority, because probably they... You know what I'm going to go ahead and say on the record? I could be totally wrong here. But I believe that the the Cato Road facility, after what they said about the battery and powertrain here, that the, the... the yields and, and quality of the batteries are high enough, and they're focusing on improving the, the last 10% that bottlenecks production. So they've got a good yield on the 4680s. They just can't produce them at high enough scale yet, and that's where their focus is. But they're still building the cell facilities at Berlin and Texas. So they've got the basic um, layout of the, of, the run, uh, of the assembly line down. I think they could sell Tesla semis. They just would not be profitable at all. Um, just with the cost that goes into the prototype lines and they haven't quite figured out how to lower the overall cost of 4680 production. I know that the point of the 4680s was to make batteries cheaper, but in their initial startup phase, that's not directly when they're cheaper. It takes a lot of volume production for them to actually start lowering the costs and get them moving really, really quick off the assembly line. And the Tesla Semi... um, I bet they could build them. I mean, we've seen Tesla manufacture several prototypes... Um, at the last earnings call, they they uploaded a photo of the updated Tesla Semi, and they're they're d- uh, doing track testing with it and prototyping it. So, I believe that the the range is doable, and I believe the weight isn't as bad as people think it is. And if if Tesla just had infinite forty six eighties, they would be able to deliver them. But they had to make the call between: Do we take these new next generation batteries and put them into Model Ys, where we can sell like? a 75 or 80 kilowatt hour pack for 54 or $60,000 a piece? Or do we put these 4680s into, you know, a, a one megawatt hour pack in a semi that we can sell for $200,000? So it's like over 10 times the amount of batteries for about four times the price. In other words, way less profitable. Um, so that's why I think the Tesla semi is deprioritized. But... Um, it, semi trucks account for a disproportionate amount of emissions on the road. They they cause 
a whole lot of uh, emissions because of how much gas they use, and they're not very efficient at all. And uh, they're very noisy and dangerous. They're they're a large amount of weight to be moving around. And I've seen myself firsthand how dangerous certain truck drivers can be. With and it, I I can think of tons of situations where that wouldn't have been a problem if that semi truck had autopilot or or at least had uh, regenerative braking or um, acceleration that was much better. And of course, if it wasn't emitting tons and tons of emissions and carbon monoxide every time it started up. Um, the, the cost savings, I believe, are real, and I think the product is solid. It's just a production problem. I don't believe it's a repairability issue. <laughs> it's not. It's definitely not a demand issue. Tons of companies are uh, got the semi on order. So to me, the semi is an important product for the market it serves, and the Roadster is is like Elon said, it's dessert. The Roadster is the least of their priorities because it does not. It's not going to be replacing. A huge cause of emissions on the road. It's a it's a marketing product, of if anything. Um, it's not a super practical product, obviously, for families. And and Tesla has already, I think, established with the Plaid Model S that okay, electric vehicles are fast, and electric vehicles can be practical and and better the com in, than the combustion engine in pretty much every way. Um, and I'm sure they're very pl proud of the Plaid Model S. And the Roadster is just kind of once again proving the same point that the plaid model s already proves which is that okay electric's faster and better than gas and okay the range is great obviously it'd be nice if the range was better but if the plaid model s is not convincing people i don't think the roadster is gonna uh convince people um if there's still people that are like eh, i don't know about these electric cars they're slow and ugly and whatever you know that the plaid model s kind of tackles that argument uh best they can um, and the Roadster is just kind of flexing on the idea that, hey, we could strap SpaceX package on the back of this thing. It's cool. Don't get me wrong. And I would love to see one. And, and don't uh, any Roadster news we get, if they if they even briefly talk about the Roadster, I'm going to make videos on it because I think it's amazing um, from an engineering standpoint and from a big fan of the brand. It's a beautiful vehicle and I want it to come out. But I understand why the Roadster is the least of their priorities. I just hope that Tesla Semi comes out uh, first because it was promised before the Roadster was. And um, Cybertruck is just insane amount of demand. And it seems like Texas is working on that. So I, I assume that uh, Cybertruck is next right after Model Y comes out of Texas. Um, let me check the chat here. How many cars do you think will be delivered in Q3? I think it's probably just going to be an incremental increase of a few thousand because of no new factories in Q3. Well, Q3 will probably have a lot more Model S's and X's, maybe X's accounted for. I'm not sure if the X will be done by then. But uh, in Q2, there were basically zero, um, almost zero Model S's accounted for. And now the production rate for Model S's will increase a little bit. So yeah, I think it'll be a, a tad higher. Maybe, maybe not substantially higher, but who knows? The production rate can can ramp later in the year. It's it's happened before, so I don't know two forty, two fifty thousand. I'm trying to remember what last quarter's was. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have them memorized. Should have them right here. Uh, total production was at two hundred six thousand. Yeah, I might say two thirty, two forty, somewhere in there. Um, when's it start? We've got about eight minutes before the earnings call begins, and yes, you will be able to hear the earnings call on this live stream. I'm going to cut to uh, this angle, and I'm going to shut up so you don't have to listen to me the whole time. But you will be able to see my face and reactions to things. And I'll just be hanging out in the chat, typing with you guys and listening to what's going on. But yeah, you'll you'll be able to tune into the broadcast here. Roadster makes much more sense with 100 plus kilowatt hours and weighs less than 1,800 kilograms. Yeah, it's probably going to be 200 kilowatt hours. Also, for Roadster, they're waiting on energy density improvement for 4680. I don't think that's the problem. I, I They probably could have fit a 200-kilowatt-hour battery in the Roadster in 2017. The, the bigger issue is it's uh, not a high-volume vehicle, and it doesn't change much for their mission statement. And again, it's just kind of tackling uh, the, the subject that the Plaid Model S is already doing fine. Um, Roadster is just as late as Cybertruck. Cybertruck's not technically late yet, and and nothing in the shareholder deck has alluded to the Cybertruck being late. In fact, um, there's multiple ways to interpret this, guys, but if you want to be optimistic, right here in the end category, they mentioned that 
they've shifted the launch of the semi truck to 2022, right? They did not say that for the cyber truck. Could have been very easy for them to say we've shifted the launch of the semi truck and cyber truck to 2022, but they didn't say that. All they said was that the cyber truck is planned for Austin production after Model Y. So at no point during the Q2 earnings report have they mentioned that they want the Cybertruck to be delayed. And so far, you know, when they first unveiled it, I'm not saying it's going to come out this year. I, I'm saying it's most likely not, but I'm just saying they have not officially delayed it. And if you're talking about one is later than the other, Cybertruck's not late yet. Um, the original promise timeline was that production would be in late 2021. So until we're in late 2021 and production has not begun, Cybertruck's not technically late. We can look at what's going on and say, okay, it's probably not going to be on schedule, but that doesn't make it late. That's just our projections. You know, things could change, could actually pull a fast one on us and actually start ramping them up quicker than we thought. Um, oh, Lillian, thank you. <laughs> Someone said... <clears throat> Nothing to ask, but just wanted to say thank you for what you're doing. Appreciate you watching. I appreciate it. Um, a buddy works for Tesla told me the first Cybertruck is rolling off the line in October. Yeah, I don't, I don't buy it. Um, I, I've seen a source say the same thing. Uh, Rob Maurer was talking to an uh, insider source at Tesla. And the thing to keep in mind is Elon and Tesla as well has very ambitious and aggressive timelines. I'm sure internal and external that they miss constantly. Um I'm thinking of doing a video about that, why like a lot of things Tesla does are late. Um, and there's actually good reasons for them to have overly ambitious timelines, even if they don't hit them. But uh, I'm sure internally they're saying like, yeah, Cybertrucks need to be out and produced by October. That's probably what Elon's asking for. And that's what Tesla is telling the people at Giga Texas. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, that's just what they're aiming. That's That's what they're shooting for. And I don't think that's Julian. Sorry. I don't get the J on the chat. Uh, what do you think will be the next car Tesla will deliver? Most likely uh, model-wise from Texas. I I, am, I I might be a little weird on that one, but I'm actually going to go out and say that I think Giga Texas will be producing vehicles before Berlin. Berlin is just so caught up with paperwork and all this random stuff um, that's holding them back. And uh, Giga Texas, I don't think, has that same legal hurdle to jump through that... Um, uh, Berlin does and, and Texas started later and it's already catching up um, at the rate and I think surpassing Berlin pretty quick with the cell the cell production area is done and the paint shop is being tested and all that and they've got the body uh, body and white section they've got pictures of it here in the shareholder deck and it, getting ready to assemble parts and vehicles and they're testing the casting press and all that so I think Texas will be done first um, so that's the next vehicle they're going to deliver after that, probably, I guess, uh, if you count it as a separate vehicle, the next generation Model Ys with the 4680s will come out of Texas shortly after then Berlin. And then after that, the next vehicle is probably going to be tri-motor Cybertrucks. I think that they're going to start with the expensive ones. Um, Crazy Rodzilla says, love all your Tesla updates. Keep up the good work. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Uh, I know a guy who works for Rivian that said the R1T was supposed to roll out in June of 2020. <laughs> yeah, right. Everyone's late, including Tesla. Everybody's late. Um, I'm a car hauler for Tesla, and the problem I heard they are having... Oh, the message was retracted. Okay, I was going to read it, but he took it back. Less battery weight may also improve Roadster performance. A 200 kilowatt is too excessive. 620 mile range is just carrying a lot of weight. It's not just about range it's the it's the number of batteries allow you to exert a certain amount of torque all at once um i don't think the weight makes a huge difference to be honest with you but um at a certain point you the the problem is no longer your weight or your grit uh your uh torque on the motors it becomes more about the grip you have on the track so if you don't have much weight in the battery your tires are going to spin out a lot faster. So it might actually make more sense for the vehicle to weigh more so that the grip can be a little bit better in those 0 to 60 times. And um, in order to beat the Plaid Model S speed, you're going to need SpaceX package anyway. There's just not physically a way for you to accelerate uh, m much faster than the Plaid Model S. Maybe a little bit in the, in the peak. Uh, once you start going over 60, you might be able to accelerate faster. 
Philip Poche, thank you for the super chat. Uh, five bucks says thanks for the hard work as always. What's cheaper than the super chat that I haven't actually talked about yet is uh, I did turn on YouTube memberships for this channel. Um, no pressure, but it lets you use custom emotes in the live streams in the comment sections. You get uh, loyalty badges that show the little autopilot symbol. and the, you got to be on a browser to sign up for it. I don't think it works on the iOS app. Um, but... Yeah, you can support the channel directly now. It's only $2 a month, um, and that helps me keep the channel you know, sponsor-free. Obviously, uh, life costs money. Having all these cameras and equipment and stuff costs money. And I, love do and I just love talking about EVs and making content about Tesla and stuff. So as long as I'm making enough through this channel, I'm able to keep uh, doing this for a living and, and make it a full-time job and do spontaneous uh, reactions and live streams like this. Um, I think your weight theory is wrong for acceleration and handling. Okay, fair enough. I'm just saying that the the Roadster's not a huge priority, and I don't think the 4680s were the reason it's late. <laughs> I think it's because um, they they weren't waiting for the 4680s. They're just everything else is more important than the Roadster, essentially. Um, but yeah, I th I think it should be the first link in the. Wait, let me check. Oh, that's weird. It's not here in the description. It well, it's the uh, the join button basically is what you're looking for. When do you think the Model X will start to deliver to Tesla? Probably September or October, I'm hoping. But anyway, the earnings call should be starting soon, so I'm gonna get that loaded up. And I don't want to get that. Um, it's just playing music right now. But um, as soon as they actually start talking, I will shut up, and you'll be able to hear it. Thoughts on the new update, FSD Beta 9.1? Overall, I'm not too convinced that it's going to change much. Um, beta 9 was kind of exactly what I was expecting. It was like slightly better here and there, but... Oh, they're saying... They're saying, please be patient. Yep, yeah, Elon is always is running a little bit late. Um, all these earnings calls are late. That's I'm just kind of planning for that now. That's why I'm not shutting up yet. But um, I think that the the full self driving uh, future that Tesla is aiming for is far more complicated than most people think. And I think it'll take a long, long time before we're able to get to level three or four or five even. So um, I'm excited for the development, and I watch all those videos really closely because I want to see it get better. But um, Basically, we were promised for like months and months and months that Beta 9 was just going to be this monumental leap and it would be so much better and there'd be so much less interventions. And it ended up being slightly better, but still kind of making a lot of mistakes for people. And it's still like, to me, it's a game changer when it becomes boring. Right now, it's still interesting and people watch videos because you can see, oh, it didn't do that right. Oh, it did that right, but it didn't do that right. Um, they're probably not going to hit level three until... It's flawless uh, most of the time. Not flawless, but it's um, it's becoming rare for people to have to intervene. Like, whoa, someone actually had to take over. Normally, people just turn it on and it just goes for like the whole trip. And, and be zero intervention drives have to become the norm. They have to become standard for most environments. And until that point, um, they're not going to even move to level three. Um, let's see. There's no way it can be producing in October. You can still see straight through the building. What we're talking Model X, not Cybertruck. We all know that everything adds up with the numbers they can produce. Most probably they can think more about Semi and Roadster and maybe Model 2 once Berlin and Austin is done. Yeah, I'm hoping so. Hopefully we get more growth on that next year. What is the feature you want most on the Cybertruck? Known and hoped for. I reserved the dual motor and I can't wait. Hmm windshield wipers i want to see just what the final production model looks like i'm still disappointed we can't see it um and if wind if uh, side view mirrors are required then i want to see what those look like on the cyber truck feature wise i don't know in, it, in its current state it's pretty great i would love a smaller one elon has teased that several times but i was in my grandfather's uh f-150 recently which was pretty close in size to the cyber truck and i was not in love with that 
size. <laughs> I just like cars that are easier to park, and I don't like driving big trucks because I had to drive a big F-350 for my Mandarin Ranch job many years ago. And I had to drive that truck all the time, and I always hated it. I just felt stressed out like I was going to hit everything and felt like driving a huge tank. And that's probably the feeling they're going for with the Cybertruck. So I get why it's big. Bigger trucks sell better. But I'm just weird, and I'm not like most pickup truck buyers. I, I like smaller trucks that are practical. And I like the cyber aesthetic, and I like the way it looks, and I like how durable, and I like the exoskeleton um, design aspects of it. I love the interior. That's like my favorite interior of ever, any vehicle. I just I don't want to drive around a giant vehicle. I, I would love a smaller truck if they had one. Um, let's see. F Elon says, FSD Beta 9 will be the biggest change ever. FSD Beta 9 lines instead of dots. <laughs> yeah. There were certainly some improvements, but it's still got a long ways to go. Um, still working on a Model 3 one day, or maybe it's now a Model Y that you're thinking about? I'm not really thinking about it much because, again, me and my wife both work from home, and on average we drive less than five miles a day. So I would much rather spend my money on investments and, and stocks, um, speaking of Tesla stock, because I know that the value of that is pretty much guaranteed to go up in the long haul. Uh, over time, uh, all these shares and stocks we're looking at are just going to get more and more expensive, so best to get them now, whereas Tesla vehicles are only going to get cheaper and better over time. Essentially, the longer you're willing to wait, the better vehicle you're going to get, and I'm not in a position in life where I drive a lot or or travel much. <laughs> I oftentimes go three or four days without leaving the house. Or, well, we go outside, but we just don't drive anywhere. So Tesla's not uh, high on the list. I'd be very curious for the 4680 model-wise and, and how the range is going to be on those and also the 25K model when that comes out. I want to see what kind of compromises it has. But, yeah, I'm basically just not in a rush. There's not really a point in rushing it. Um, not planning on buying one soon, no, just because I it would it would sit in my garage all day and do nothing. I would, I would have to actively go out and drive it just for the sake of driving it, which would be cool, but it's just expensive. You know, if you would have... There, there were people that reserved a Founder Series Roadster in 2017 for like a quarter million dollars. If instead of reserving that Roadster, they would have invested in Tesla stock, they would be able to buy like 10 or 15 Roadsters now. So that gives you a little bit of perspective on my mindset of buy a car now or invest in the company and buy the car when you need it because I don't really need one right now. Um Selling them without mirrors is illegal. Driving without mirrors isn't. Shipping with fake mirrors is possible and just have owners pop them off. Yeah, that could work. There's actually... I, I did some more research on it, and it's... There is actually a few laws about having side view mirrors, even post-delivery. Um, and it, it just depends on the state. Certain states allow it, and other states don't. So it's, it's on a per-state basis whether or not you'd be able to just pop the mirrors off the Cybertruck because you don't want them to be there. I don't think in California you could... Um, there are several states that require them, even even if you modified the vehicle. Um, but windshield wipers is going to be a requirement regardless. You're going to need those, <laughs> even if uh, I don't, I'm sure there's a law that you need them. But I don't think that law is changing anytime soon. Wonder how much monthly FSD revenue they'll see in the next quarter's report. I'm assuming it'll be broken out. I think it'll be pretty high. I think there's going to be a ton of people that are willing to subscribe to it but not pay for it outright. I just think that the likelihood of someone dropping $10,000 on a software package is pretty low compared to the number of people that are willing to drop $200 just for a month to see how they feel. Um, even if you'd have to subscribe to FSD for over four years for it to be worth buying outright, um, consider people could just subscribe half the year. Uh, or, or subscribe four months or three months out of the year. Now it's going to take you 10 or 12 years to break even. Um, and you could, instead of dropping $10,000 all at once, you could drop $200 on FSD and then invest $9,800 into stocks and watch those stocks grow in value a lot more. So Julian says, same logic on my end. Got like 10 stocks three years ago, and once I'll need a car, we'll sell them and could help save some borrowed money from the banks. Oh, I think they're going to start. Here we go. Financial results and Q&A webcast. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. 
After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star one on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star zero. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Martin Vieca, Senior Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Tesla's second quarter 2021 Q&A webcast. I'm joined today by Elon Musk, Zachary Kirkhorn, and a number of other executives. Our Q2 results were announced at about 1 p.m. Pacific time in the update deck we published at the same link as this webcast. During this call, we will discuss our business outlook and make forward-looking statements. These comments are based on our predictions and expectations as of today. Actual events and results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those mentioned in our most recent filings with the SEC. During the question and answer portion of today's call, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Please press star one now if you would like to join the question queue. But before we jump into Q&A, Elon has some opening remarks. Elon? Sure. <clears throat> so to recap, Q2 2021 was a record quarter on many levels. We achieved record production, deliveries, and surpassed over a billion dollars in, in gap net income for the first time in Tesla history. I'd really like to congratulate everyone at Tesla for an amazing job. This is really an, an incredible milestone. Um, it also seems that public sentiment towards EVs is at an inflection point. And uh, at this point, I think almost everyone agrees that uh, electric vehicles are the only way forward. Um, regarding supply chain, while we're making cars at full speed, the global chip shortage situation remains quite serious. Uh, for the rest of this year, our growth rate will be determined by the, the slowest part in our supply chain, which uh, is a, a, there's, there are a wide range of chips that are at various times the slowest part in the supply chain. I mean, it's worth noting that if we had everything else, if we had uh, vast numbers of vehicles and cells, uh, we, we would not be able to make make them. Uh, if everything except the chips, we wouldn't be able to make them. The, the chip chip supply is fundamentally um, the governing factor on our uh, output. Um, it is difficult for us to say how long this will last because uh, we, we don't have. It's, 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 this is this is out of our control essentially. Um, it does. It does seem like it's getting better, um, but uh, it's hard to predict. Um, so, uh, in, in fact, e even achieving the output that we did achieve was uh, only due to an immense effort from people within Tesla. Um, we uh, were able to substitute al alternative uh, chips and then uh, write the firmware uh, in a matter of weeks. It's not just a matter of swapping out a chip, you also have to rewrite the software. So um, it was uh, an inter incredibly intense effort of uh, finding new chips, writing new firmware, integrating with the vehicle, and, and testing in order to maintain uh, production. And, um, and I'd also like to thank our suppliers uh, who worked with us. Uh, and uh, there have been many calls, you know, midnight, 1 a.m., just uh, with, with, with suppliers uh, in resolving a lot of the uh, shortages. So uh, thanks very much to our suppliers. Um, let's see, in terms of FSD subscription, we were able to launch a uh, full self-driving subscription um, last month. And um, we, we expect it to, to build slowly, and, and then but then gather a lot of momentum over time. Um, obviously, we need to have the full self-driving build uh, widely available for it really to take off at uh, at a high rate, and um, making a lot of progress there. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I think FSD subscription will be a significant factor probably next year. Um, with regard to Giga Texas and Giga Berlin, uh, we're actually doing this earnings call from Giga Texas, so we're in the factory right now doing this earnings call. This earnings call, um, and the, the team has made incredible progress here. You can see the the pictures online. And uh, I see that there's basically nothing a year ago, and uh, and there's the you know, a large, a mostly complete large factory <laughs> a year later. Um, so it's really really great work by the Giga Texas team, um, and uh, and then also great great work uh, in Berlin 
uh, or Brandenburg, uh, with the, the team there. So um, we expect uh, to be producing um, the sort of new, new design of the Model Y in both factories in limited production uh, later this year. Um, it, it's always like it's, it's not it's, it's hard to sort of explain to people who have not been through the agony of a manufacturing ramp. Um, like, why can't you just turn it on and make the you know five thousand a week? Uh, this is it is so hard to, to do manufacturing. It is so hard to do production. Uh, to first approximation, there are ten thousand unique parts and processes that have to work, and the rate of growth of production goes as fast as the least lucky um, and, and dumbest of those 10,000 things. Um, and a bunch of them are not even in our control. So <laughs> it's like, um, it, it, it's insanely difficult. Uh, I'm fond of saying that prototypes are easy and production is hard. Um, and arguably the, the, the really remarkable thing that Tesla has done is not not to make an electric car or to be a, a car startup, because there have been hundreds of car startups uh, in the United States uh, and outside the United States. Uh, so the thing that's remarkable is that Tesla didn't go bankrupt in, in reaching volume production. That's the amazing part, because everyone else did. Um, because they all thought the prototype or the idea was the, the, the hard part, and it is not. It is trivial by comparison with actual production. So um, it's always worth noting um, that uh, of, of all the American car companies, there are only two that have not gone bankrupt, and that is Ford and Tesla. So you know, um, the seeds of defeat are sown on the day of victory, and we must be careful that we do not do that. So often, if you look at the if you look at the look at history, so often. Uh, the Caesar's beat our son on the day of victory. We will endeavor not to make that the case at Tesla. So let's see, the, the Model Y is in Texas and made in Texas and um, Berlin will be will look very much like the Model Ys we currently make, but the, there are substantial improvements in the uh, difficulty of manufacturing. Um, so for example, the Model Y uh, made here and in Berlin will have a cast front body and a cast rear body, um, whereas the one in, in California has a cast rear body but not a cast front body. Um, we're also aiming to do a structural pack with 4680s cells, um, which is a mass reduction and a cost reduction. And um, But we're not counting on that as the only way to make things work. We have a sort of a backup plan with um, non-structural, with a non-structural pack, and um, 2170s essentially. So, uh, but at scale production, we obviously want to be using 4680s and uh, structural pack. Uh, from a physics standpoint, this is the best architecture, and from an economic standpoint, it is the lowest cost way to go. So the lightest, lowest cost. Um, but there's a lot of new technology there, so it is difficult to predict with precision. Um, when does it work, and when do you reach scale scale production? Um, and Drew's going to talk a bit more about the 4680 production. Um, yeah, so <laughs> uh, we are making great progress on the 4680 cells, um, but th but there are there is a tremendous amount of innovation that we're packing into into that 4680 cell, and so uh, it's not simply um, a, a sort of minor improvement on state of the art. Uh, there are, and we went through this on the battery cell day, um, really dozens of, you know, half a dozen major improvements and dozens of, of small improvements. Um, so I think it will be great, um, but it's difficult to say when the last of the of, of the technical challenges will be solved. Um, so in conclusion, our team continues to make huge efforts to make our factories run at full speed, which is very difficult. Um, we have had some uh, factory shutdowns due to uh, part shortages, uh, and we hope those will be uh, relieved in the, in the coming weeks and months. Um, and uh, we're 
making great progress on full self riding. Um, some of the progress is not easy to see because it is at a sort of a foundational software level. Um, and so then it ends up being sort of a two steps forward, one step back situation. Um, and uh, But over time, if you do two steps forward, one step back, and keep going, you do move forward. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm highly confident that uh, the cars um, will be capable of full self-driving. Um, if they have a full self-driving computer and uh, the cameras, um, I'm confident that they will be able to drive themselves with a safety level substantially greater than that of the average person. Um, once again, thanks to all of our employees who are making this a, a, a breakthrough year for Tesla and an incredible quarter. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. And we have some follow-up remarks from Zachary Kirkhorn. Yeah, thanks, Martin, and thanks, Elon. Uh, just to reiterate, Q2 was a great quarter for the Tesla team with strong improvements across the business. In particular, auto gross profit and margin, excluding credits, increased substantially. This was primarily driven by better cost optimization across our factories, good execution against our cost reduction plans, as well as increases in production and delivery volume. There was some benefit from pricing action, mostly in North America. However, it was small in the context of the other contributors. Note that the Model S and X program was at a slight loss for the quarter due to the relatively low volume. And supply chain challenges, including expedites, continue to provide cost headwinds. Additionally, it's encouraging to see the progress made on profitability within our energy and services and other businesses. While there's some benefit to looking at our progress quarter over quarter, I find it more helpful to look at progress over a slightly long-term horizon. Over the last two years, our vehicle delivery volumes have more than doubled. This volume increase was made possible by a steady decrease in AFPs of more than 10%, driven by a roadmap to increase affordability and shifting mix towards our more affordable vehicles. Yet over that same period of time, our auto gross margin, excluding credits, has increased nearly 10 percentage points to our highest yet since the introduction of Model 3. This is only possible because our average cost per vehicle has reduced by more than the reduction in average price. This is a remarkable achievement in the context of the volume growth and AFP reduction as mentioned, and a testament to the hard work by the Tesla team. Additionally, OPEX as a percentage of revenue has declined, and in particular SG&A, representing the work we've done to become more efficient as we scale the company while still making the required R&D investments to support our future. As a result, our gap operating margins have risen from negative to double digit in line with what we have guided. By managing our overhead costs and driving higher volumes, our P&L is benefiting from the marginal profitability of each incremental unit. Or said differently, we are recognizing the benefits of scale and improved fixed cost absorption. With strong operating cash flows and cash balance, we are putting that cash to use. CapEx continues to tick up, primarily driven by capacity investments in Austin, Berlin, and Shanghai. Additionally, each quarter we are using our cash to retire legacy debt which was taken on at a time when interest rates and company risk were much higher than in today's environment. As I've mentioned before, our 2021 volumes will skew towards the second half of the year as we push for continued sequential increases in volume. Despite the great work so far managing the instability of the supply chain, these challenges remain and are unfortunately increasing in pain with the higher volume. As we work through the uncertainty, we want to ensure we do our best to manage customer wait times, as well as the impact these interruptions have on our employees and costs. And as Elon mentioned, volume growth will be determined by part availability, as we have the factory capacity ready and are in a strong demand position. I'm excited to see the progress made by the Tesla team as we continue um, building the business and strengthening our financials. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Zach. And now let's go to the retail investor questions on uh, say.com. The, the first question from Robert M. is, uh, Tesla's website still says Cybertruck production is expected to begin in late 2021. Can Tesla share more details on the current status of the Cybertruck and confirm if production is still expected? Okay. Lars, do you want to... Sorry, we cut out there for a second. Um, yeah, the Cybertruck is um, 
currently in its uh, alpha stages. We finished basic engineering architecture of the vehicle. Um, with the Cybertruck, we're redefining how the vehicle is to be made. As Elon said, it carries much of the structural pack and large casting designs of the Model Y being built in Berlin and Austin. Um, obviously, those take priority over the Cybertruck, but we are moving into the um, beta phases of Cybertruck later this year, and um, we'll be looking to ramp that in production in uh, Giga, Texas, after uh, Model Y is up and going. Yeah, it's just worth reemphasizing that, that the, the extraordinarily difficult the ex extraordinary difficulty of of ramping uh, production of large manufactured items. Um, the risk of being repetitive, it is it's actually easy to make prototypes or sort of handle small volume production, but uh, anything produced at, at high volume, which is really what's, what's relevant here, is um, it, it's going to move as fast as the slowest of the, say, rough order of magnitude, 10,000 unique parts and processes. And so you could have 9,999, <laughs> but just one is missing. Um, I mean, we were, we were missing, for example, like a, a big struggle this quarter was uh, the, the, the module that controls the airbags and the seatbelts. <laughs> And obviously, you cannot ship a car without those, um, and, and that that uh, that limited our production uh, severely in, uh, worldwide uh, in Shanghai and in Fremont. So uh, it like wouldn't have mattered if we had like 17 different car models because we they all need the airbag module. <laughs> so it's just irrelevant. Um, so the. In, in order for Cybertruck and Semi to scale to volume that's meaningful for customer deliveries, uh, we, we've got to solve um, the, the chip shortage, uh, or you know, working with our suppliers. And people sometimes say, "Why don't you just build a chip fab?" Okay, well, okay, that would take us, you know, even moving like like lightning, 12 to 18 months. Um, so it's not like yeah, you can just whip up a chip fab. You know, it's just like yeah, I'll just make a quick chip fab. Um, so, um, you know, some of these things are, the, you know, uh, yeah, anyway, um, it is quite a trial dealing with all of the constraints of scaling a large manufactured object. I, I think it may be the case that Tesla is is scaling, um, it, it, it is, it's, I think we might be the fastest in history uh, ever for scaling um, a large manufactured object. Um, I think maybe the Model T uh, would have been comparable back in the day, uh, the Ford Model T. Um, uh, probably the internet knows the answer, but I, I think we may be scaling large manufactured objects at the, at the fastest rate in history, or, or I'd like to know who did, did it faster <laughs> so we can learn from them. Um, so it's worth just noting that, um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not bad. Um, so. Um, yeah, so the Cybertruck and Semi actually both are heavy users of, of, of cell capacity. So we've got to make sure we have the cell capacity uh, for those two vehicles, or it's, it's kind of pointless. We can make a small number of, of, of vehicles, um, but the, the, the effect of cost if you make a small number of vehicles is, is insane. Like they would literally cost, uh, you know, a million dollars a piece <laughs> or more. <laughs> and, and, there's a reason why you do things at volume production, uh, which is to get the economies of scale that get the cost down. Um, so, uh, but we are, we are looking at a pretty massive increase in cell availability next year. Um, but it's not like in January one; it's it's it comes through through uh, you know it ramps up through the course of next year. Um, but. Uh, even without Tesla, Tesla's into Hello? Okay. Um, uh, even without um, Tesla cell production, uh, we believe our suppliers will be able to deliver about twice as much cell output in next year as this year. Uh, Andrew, do you want to talk more about that? Uh, yeah. Given concerns over sales bottleneck and growth, our target is to grow cell supply ahead of the 50% year-on-year growth targets of the vehicle business and also enable increased energy storage deployments. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, our cell suppliers are tracking to double their production in 2022. Yeah. It, it, um, it's, it's worth noting, like, if you have a target of a of certain number, that doesn't mean it's, it, it happens like as sure as night follows day. It, it's a target. Uh, so if there is some calamity in the, in the world that interrupts the supply chain, then it will be less. Um, but uh, the, the contracts that we have with cell suppliers call for roughly a doubling of cell, uh, of cell supply to Tesla in 2022. Um, and we have to juggle these uh, exponential, there's a whole bunch of exponential graphs sort of overlaid on top of each other. Um, and small changes in where, where you are on the x-axis of time uh, can quite substantially change the area under the curve. So um, what, we, what we're thinking of doing is like, uh, at, at, depending on it's basically overshooting on cell supply for vehicles, and then uh, as if, if, as we have say excess cell supply in, in one month or another, then then routing that cell output to the mega pack and power wall, um, or by the same token, if you know we're, we're prioritizing vehicle production, um, if there's a if, if there's a shortage of cell output for some reason, then we will throttle down. Mega pack and power wall production. So that could be something's got to give, basically. Or if there's a disruption to vehicle production, yeah, we have an outlet for the cell capacity. Yes, exactly. It's, uh, um, there's, there's a tremendous amount of inertia in the supply chain. Um, so if we say to a supplier, we want you to double cell output, well, even doing that in a year is very difficult. And then that 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 system has a tremendous amount of momentum. It is like a flotilla of super tankers. Uh, <laughs> it's insane. Speaking of which, from a raw materials perspective, we, we also have long-term contracts to secure our supply chain to also enable this growth. So we're, we're not just looking at the suppliers, but upstream from there. Yeah. Exactly. Which is more flotilla. <laughs> yeah, okay. exactly. It, it, as, as mentioned, things will move as fast as the slowest part of the entire supply chain, which goes all the way back to you know raw materials, mm -hmm. um, you know, the lithium and nickel and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, there's the, the, the sometimes mis misperception that Tesla uses a lot of cobalt, but we actually don't. Uh, uh, Apple uses, uh, I think, almost 100% co uh, cobalt in, in their batteries and cell phones and, and laptops. Uh, but Tesla uses no cobalt in the, um, the iron, iron phosphate packs and uh, almost, almost none in the nickel-based chemistries. So, um, on a weighted average basis, we, we might use 2% cobalt compared to, say, Apple's 100% cobalt. Um, anyway, so it's just, uh, it's, it's really just not a factor. We, we expect to basically uh, have zero cobalt in the future. So, um, you know, I, I do, it's maybe worth learning, I, I think probably there is a long-term shift uh, more in the direction of iron-based lithium-ion cells uh, rather than over nickel. Um, as as the energy density of sort of iron, or what's called typically iron phosphate, uh, but you might, you might as well just call it iron. The phosphate is <laughs> taken for granted. Uh, but so iron-based cells, lithium-ion cells, and nickel-based lithium-ion cells, um, I think probably we'll see a shift. My guess is probably to two-thirds uh, iron, one-third nickel, or something on that order. Um, and uh, this is actually good because there's um, plenty of iron in the world. There's um, an insane amount of iron. Um, but nickel is, there's much less nickel, and there's way less cobalt. So um, it is good for uh, relieving the long term scaling um, to move to iron based uh, cells uh, mostly. Um, and I think long term, uh, possibly all, there's a good chance that all. Um, Stationary storage, uh, that is Powerwall and Megapack, uh, moves to iron. This is most likely the case, uh, since you do not need to transport it, and there's less of volume and mass constraint for stationary storage. So then uh, nickel would be for uh, really for long-range uh, road transports, you know, ships and aircraft and that kind of thing. Thank you. Uh
Let's go to the second question from retail, which is, Elon has said that Tesla will be op uh, opening up the supercharger network to other EVs later this year. Can you share some more details on how this will be structured? Will this be a select brands or will they contribute to the, to the growth of this network? Yes, we're currently thinking it's a real simple thing where um, you just download the Tesla app and you go to a supercharger um, and you just indicate uh, which stall you're in. Uh, so you, you plug in uh, your, your car, even if it's not a Tesla, and then you just access the app and say, turn on the stall that I'm in for how much electricity. Um, and this should basically work with, I think, um, almost any manufacturer's cars. Um, there, there will be a time constraint. So if the charge rate is, is super slow, then uh, somebody will be charged more because uh, the, the the biggest constraint at the superchargers is time. Not, um, the you know how how occupied is the stall, um, and we'll, we'll also be smarter with how how we charge for uh, electricity at the superchargers. So you know r rush hour charging will be more expensive than um, off hours charging because. There are times when the superchargers are empty and times when they're jam-packed, and so it makes sense to have some um, time-based uh, uh, discrimination. On yeah, that. we've yeah. been doing that, and it's been working, and people yeah. respond, and it helps with utilization. And yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I think we're um, in, in, in Europe and China and most parts of the world. Uh, it's, a, it's the same connector for everyone. Um, so this is a fairly easy thing to do. Uh, developed our own connector, um, which, in my opinion, is actually uh, the best connector. It's, it's small and light, and looks good. It's no standard. So we developed our own connector, um, which, in my opinion, is actually uh, the best connector. It's, it's small and light, and looks good. Um, so th an adapter is needed to work for um, EVs in, in North America. Um, but people could buy this adapter, um, and we uh, anticipate having it available at the superchargers as well uh, if people don't, don't sort of steal them or something. <laughs> we have a good solution for that. Okay. <laughs> um, so, but, but uh, you know, that, that is just the, that's a constraint on the North American thing. Yeah. That's, that's basically a vestige of history. But uh, I think we, we do want to emphasize that it, it is, our goal is to uh, support the advent of sustainable energy. Uh, it is not to create a walled garden um, and use that to bludgeon our competitors, <laughs> which is sometimes used by some companies. <coughs> <laughs> I, I think it's also important to comment that uh, increasing the, the utilization of the network actually reduces our costs, which allows us to um, uh, lower charging prices for all customers, makes the network more profitable, allows us to grow the network faster. So it's a good thing there. Um, and, then, and no matter what, we're going to continue to aggressively expand the network capacity, increasing charging speed, improving the trip planning tools to protect against site congestion using dynamic pricing, as Elon mentioned, yeah. and just continue to focus on minimum wait time for all customers. Yeah, obviously, in order for this to, to be, for the supercharger to be useful to, to other car companies, cars, uh, we need to grow the network uh, faster than we're growing vehicle output, yeah. which is not easy. We're growing vehicle output at a, at a hell of a rate. <laughs> so, Superchargers need to grow faster than vehicle output. So this is a lot of work for the supercharger team, um, but it is only useful in, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, it's only useful to the public if we're able to grow faster than Tesla vehicle output. Uh, so that, that is our goal. Thank you very much. Uh, and the third question is, uh, Elon said 4680 cells aren't reliable enough for vehicles. Is this referring to cycle life, degradation, or something else? Uh, please update us on progress of 4680s and what is still needs to be done um, to make them reliable enough for vehicles. Um, yeah, I mean, r really, this is not. Uh, um, we'll definitely make the 4680 uh, reliable enough for vehicles, and we, I think, are at the point where, in limited volume, it is reliable enough for vehicles. Yeah. Um, the again, going back to like you know, limited production is easy. Or, Prototype production is easy, but high volume production is hard. Um, there are a number of challenges in, in transitioning from uh, sort of 
small scale production to a, a large volume production. Um, and, uh, you know, not, not to get too much into the weeds of things, but r right now we have a challenge with <laughs> basically the, what's called calendaring, or, or basically squashing the cathode material to a, a, um, a, pat a particular height. So it just goes through these rollers and gets, and gets squashed. Like like pizza dough, basically, uh, and but very hard pizza dough, um, and the it, it's causing it's it's denting the calendar rolls. Um, this is not something that that happened when the calendar rolls were smaller, but it is happening when the calendar rolls are bigger. <laughs> so just like uh, we're like okay, we weren't expecting that. Yeah. Um, it's not it's not a like science problem, it's an engineering problem. It's yeah, not a question yeah. of if, it's a question of when, and the yeah. team is 100% focused on, on resolving these limiting processes as quickly as possible. Exactly. Um, yeah, and on, on, on the reliability side, uh, as Elon mentioned, we have successfully validated performance and the lifetime uh, durability of the 4680 cells produced at Cato. Um, and we're continuing ongoing verification of that reliability. We're actually accruing over 1 million equivalent miles on our cells that we produce every month in, in our testing activities. As, you know, the focus on that is, is very clear. We want high quality cells for, for all of our customers. Um, and yeah, we're just focused on the unlucky limiting steps in the, in the, in the facility. Um, and with the engineers focused on those few steps remaining, we're going to break through as, you know, as fast as possible. Um, meantime, we're, we're, you know, we have a, a mass amount of equipment um, on order and arriving for the, the high volume uh, cell production uh, in uh, Austin and Berlin. And um, but, but obviously, given what we've learned uh, with the pilot plant, which is in in, in, um, in Fremont, which is really quite a big plant by by most standards. Um, we will have to modify a bunch of that equipment, so um, you know it won't be able to start like immediately. Uh, but it seems like, uh, I mean, do correct me if I'm wrong, but like, we think most likely uh, we will hit an annualized rate uh, of 100 gigawatt hours a year sometime next year. We'll have all the equipment installed yeah. to accomplish uh, 100 gigawatt hours, and it's, it's possible. Yeah. Uh, that by the end of the year we will be at an annualized rate of 100 gigawatt hours by yeah. the end of the year. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, my guess is more likely than not, about 50 percent of, of reaching 100 gigawatt hours a year by the end of next year on an annualized rate, something like that. Yep. Um, but it could shift by a little bit. So. Uh, yeah, but it's and like nothing as Drew mentioned, it's nothing fundamental. No, uh, just a lot of work. Yeah, and and even to the large roller question, Elon, right? Like on the anode side, the large rollers work great, no concerns. And so we're just learning as we go. Um, and uh, and the the nice thing about having that facility, you know, on the fast track like we had it, and we talked about it at, at Battery Day, was really de-risking the the big factories here. Um, yeah. That's what we've done, um, and we've learned learned a lot and. Uh, with each successive iteration, um, the ramp up and the equipment installation will be faster and more stable. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. And, and the last question from retail uh, is from Emmett. Uh, can Elon do an interview with one of our YouTube channels once or twice a year? I would nominate David Leon Investing or Rod Mauer's Tesla Daily channels as first possible candidates. Uh, Yeah, I guess uh, I, I, yeah, I'll do, do an interview. Um, I mean, just bear in mind, like, if I'm doing interviews, then I, I, I can't do actual other work, you know, so uh, <laughs> it, it, it's not, um, you know, <laughs> it's just, I don't have so much time in the day, so. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it once. No, I'm, I won't do it annually, but uh, I'll do it once. I think also, like, um, this is the. I, I, um, I wouldn't say the last time I'll do earnings calls, but this is the. I, I will no longer be default doing earnings calls. Uh, so, uh, obviously, I'll do the annual shareholder meeting, but um, I think uh, going forward, I, I will 
um, most likely not be on earnings calls unless there's something really important that um, that I need to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to institutional questions. Uh, the first one, and we covered uh, a lot of this already. Can you please update us on timelines for the start of production of Berlin and Austin, Model Y, Cybertruck, and the Semi? Do you expect the ramp of Cybertruck to be as difficult as it is a new process? I think Cybertruck ramp will be difficult because it's such a new architecture. Um, I mean, it's going to be a great product. It might, I think, be our best product ever. Um, but it does a lot of fundamentally new uh, design ideas in Cybertruck. Nobody's ever really made a car like this before, um, a vehicle like this before. So um, there will probably be challenges uh, because there's so much uh, unexplored territory. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think question two and question three we can skip uh, given we have already addressed it. So I'll go to question four. In five years' time, how much faster better could you be at manufacturing capacity expansion using cut and paste? And what are the biggest issues you need to solve to get to that rate? Well, like I said, uh, I think we might be the, the fastest growing uh, company in history for any large manufactured item. So those who have not actually been involved in a manufacturing ramp have just no idea how painful and difficult it is. Uh, it's like, you know, this, this, you got to eat a lot of glass and uh, for a manufacturing ramp, it's hard. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, if you look at the expansion we've done in Shanghai, um, you know, that, that factory was built in less than a year and ramped in, you know, five to six months to full volume. When you no, consider no, cut and paste, than that, that. By, by a year. And when you consider cut and paste, we've repeated that, you know, in, in, in Fremont and whatever. But now with Berlin and Austin, we have new uh, um, factories and new designs. And so there's always challenges, as you, as you said, Elon, with, with new designs and ramping that. But I think having teams in three locations or three continents will definitely expand our ability and our capacity to, um, you know, grow more lines uh, Rather than just having the one uh, factory in Fremont that we had, you know, a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, so I mean, for Shanghai, it was an incredible team both both the factory in eleven months, but it took longer than it longer than building the factory. which was hot. It, it took longer than that to actually reach volume production, high volume production. Um, so it took about a year. Uh, so and, and it, when you when you put a factory in a new geography. Um, in order for that factory to be efficient, you have to localize the supply chain. So it's, there's no such thing as cut and paste. It does not exist. Um, and that, you know, it would obviously be insane to do vehicle production in Europe but send vast numbers of parts from North America. That would be that, that, that would make the you know producing in Europe, for example, um, just crazy. Um, you, you've got to localize the supply chain to have efficiency, and then you, you're moving as fast as as your least lucky, uh, least good supplier. Um, yeah, it's only the supply chains where you go like, you know, three or four layers deep. Uh, it's it's uh, frankly, uh, I feel at times that we are inheriting all force majeure of, of Earth. So if anything goes wrong anywhere on Earth, something happens to mess up the supply chain. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think the human capital, the human capital growth, though, of having factory here, Berlin, Shanghai, Fremont, does allow us to maybe not exponentially grow, but well. Hopefully, we are exponentially growing. Yeah, hopefully maintain that exponential growth. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but, uh, it, it's also it takes a, a while to hire all the people and train all the people to operate the factory. A factory is like a giant cybernetic collective, um, and you can't just hire ten thousand people and have them have it work instantly. It's not possible. Um, 
I really encourage more people to get involved in manufacturing. I think, especially in the U.S., like this has just not been an area where you know all that many smart people have gone into. Um, I think the U.S. has an overallocation of talent in finance and law. Um, it's both a criticism and a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't have people in finance and law. I'm just saying that this might be, maybe we have too many smart people <laughs> in those arenas. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, so. Uh, manufacturing's fun. Yeah, manufacturing is great. Um, it's a very interesting problem to solve. Um, and and uh, obviously, um, you can't ha have stuff unless someone makes it. <laughs> That's how you get stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And let's go to the last in investor question. Uh, does Tesla plan to offer more services beyond FSD or high-speed connectivity as part of its subscription bundle going forward? What areas in particular present an opportunity? Um, yeah, we don't have a lot of ideas on this, um, to be frank. <laughs> um, Really, uh, full self driving is the main thing. Um, you know, things are obviously headed towards, you know, full auto fully autonomous electric vehicle future. And I think Tesla is well positioned and, and frankly is, is the leader objectively in, this, in both of those arenas uh, electrification and autonomy. Um, so um, there's always, it's always tempting to try to find. Um, Analogies, but but you know, with other companies, or whatever. But really, the value of a fully electric, uh, autonomous fleet is insanely gigantic, boggles the mind, really. So that will be one of the most valuable things that is ever done in the history of civilization. Thank you very much. And now let's go back to analyst Q&A, please. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. In the interest of time, we ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Our first question comes from Colin Rush with Oppenheimer. Your line is open. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Can you speak to the, the attach rates for FSD uh, so far and, and what you're, you're targeting in terms of the subscription levels? Yeah, it, it's not worth commenting on right now. It's not meaningful. Uh, we really need um, both of driving, at least the, the beta to be in wide, widely available so anyone who wants it can get it. Um, it otherwise, it would be pointless to, to read anything into where things are right now. Um, so, and, yeah. Okay, and, and then just the, the follow-up there is about the, the, the cadence of the regulatory environment keeping up with the technology. You know, are you seeing meaningful evolution in terms of the regulators really understanding the technology and, and beginning to set some standards here sometime in the near term? Um, at least in um, the U.S., we, we, we don't see uh, regulation as a fundamental limiter. Um, We've, got to, we've obviously got to make it work and then demonstrate that it, the reliability is significantly in excess of the average human driver um, for it to be allowed, um, you know, for, for, for people to be able to use it without uh, paying attention to the road. Um, but we, I think we, we have a massive fleet, so it will be, I think, uh, straightforward to make the argument on statist statistical grounds. Um, just based on the number of inter interventions, uh, you know, or especially interventions that would result in a crash uh, at scale, we think we'll have billions of miles of travel to uh, be able to show that uh, it is, you know, the safety of the car with the autopilot on is, uh, you know, 100% or 200% or more safer than the average human driver. At that point, I think it would be uh, unconscionable to not to allow the autopilot because it, the car just becomes way less safe. It would be sort of like, if you take the elevator analogy, you know, uh, back in the day, 
used to, used to have elevator operators uh, with like a big sort of switch that that and they would, they'd operate the elevator and, and move between floors. Um, but uh, you know, that, that get tired or or maybe drunk or something um, or distract distracted, and every now and again somebody would be kind of shared in half between floors. Um, that's kind of the situation we have with cars. Um, autonomy will become so safe that it will be unsafe to manually operate the, the car, relatively speaking. Um, and, um, you know, today, uh, obviously we just get in an elevator, we press the button for which floor we want, and it just takes us there safely. Um, and it would, it would be quite alarming if it was elevators were operated by a person with a giant switch. Uh, that's how it will be with cars. Thank you. Let's go to the next question, please. Next question comes from Labochi with Wolf Research. Your line is open. Hi, everybody. Um, your your costs of goods sold per vehicle is already down to the mid thirty seven thousand dollar range in the quarter. It's uh, it's down five thousand dollars year over year, despite some of the inefficiencies that that you talked about. Um, and I know that a lot uh, is going to change from here, just given how mix is going to evolve. But if you're successful on the structural pack and front and rear castings and the launch of the 4680 cell, can you just maybe give us a sense of what a successful outcome would look like maybe a year from now? Um, obviously, a lot has to go right, but just any any kind of uh, broad framework for us to think about. Yeah, it's it's really difficult for us to I mean, we to, to make specific predictions. It's very difficult. Um, you know, I think you know we feel confident of you know say at least a fifty percent growth year over year next year, um, and and maybe it's a hundred percent. But that's uh, you know we, we uh, you need a lot of crystal balls to figure out exactly what it's going to be, and we just it is literally impossible to make a specific prediction. Um, but you know, at least fifty, maybe a hundred, something like that. Okay, um, and, and maybe um, just separately from this, um, can you just clarify what the status is of uh, some of the advances in, in battery manufacturing, uh, things like dry cathode mixing that, that you talked about on on uh, Battery Day? Uh, what's the timeline? How how are those uh, evolving? Yeah, yeah we, we commented on it uh, today um, already, actually. But you know, in the in the facility at Cato, over 90% of the, the like processes have demonstrated rate right there. But we are limited by the unlucky few that have not, and that's what we're working on. Uh, one of them that Elon mentioned was um, running the the full scale uh, cathode calendar. Uh, we're we're working through some uh, improvements that we need to make to that equipment and to the the actual raw material itself to, to not have those limitations. But again, it's an engineering problem. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Um, on the mixing side, we haven't actually really had any challenges specific to your question. Um, and, uh, fundamentally, we're still happy with the, the dry process direction. In terms of the factory footprint, complexity, utility consumption, space, uh, and overall complexity simplification. Yeah, and I mean, and the cost associated with everything that I just mentioned. Yeah, but, and, and if you, if you don't have overemphasize dry cathode. I mean, it's it is a you know uh, I don't know maybe it's like ten or fifteen percent of the cost improvement or something like that. I don't know twenty percent maybe over oh, when. Oh, yeah, ten, 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 ten closer percent. to ten. Yeah. yeah, so so it's like just just like people don't think like this is like the Messiah or something. Uh, you know, wet versus dry <laughs> reduces to dry is like 10% less cost than wet. <laughs> so it's not, um, you know, now 10%, you know, still nothing to sneeze at, um, especially if you're making, you know, hundreds of gigawatt hours a year. Um, but it's not, it's not the, the size, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. We can go to the next question, please. Next question comes from Pierre Farragui with New Street Research. Your line is open. 
Hey, thanks. Um, thanks very much for taking my question. I have another question actually on batteries, but uh, on a slightly different angle. I was wondering how um, you're looking at your sourcing strategy for the 4680. You've talked a lot about all the work you're doing to develop your in-house production. Uh, but what about asking other battery manufacturers to do 4680 cells with their own technology, uh, maybe less, uh, less innovation than uh, what you guys are lining up internally? And, and I was wondering if the first 4680 cell that we'll see uh, on the road will definitely come from Tesla's own manufacturing uh, lines or whether they could be coming actually from outside suppliers as well. Now have a quick follow-up. Uh, yeah, we, we are in fact uh, working with our um, existing suppliers to produce 4680 uh, format cells. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, this is just a guess right now. Um, but you know, I, I see us sort of like consolidating around a 4680 uh, nickel-based structural pack, and uh, for long-range vehicles, and then uh, not necessarily a 4680 format, but some other format uh, for uh, iron-based cells. Um, and so, we, 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 right now, we, we kind of have the Baskin Robbins of batteries situation, uh, <laughs> where there's <laughs> we have so many formats and, and so many chemistries uh, that it's uh, like we've got like 36 flavors of a battery at this point. You know, um, this is just this this results in an, an engineering drag coefficient um, where each variant of cell chemistry and format uh, requires uh, a certain amount of engineering to maintain it and troubleshoot, and um, and this uh, inhibits our forward progress. So. It is going to be important to consolidate to uh, just maybe ideally two form factors, maybe three, but, but ideally two, um, and um, and then just uh, you know one one nickel chemistry and one iron chemistry, and uh, so uh, we don't have to, to troubleshoot so many different variants. Yeah, and towards that end, we're, we are engaging with the suppliers that we've had good partnerships with on 4680 designs to enable that simplification and, you know, so so far so good. You know, they're working on, uh, they're bringing their core competencies to bear on that. We're not mandating, like, what's going on inside, but, but uh, it, it's been a good, good collaboration. Yeah. Um, you know, and we, we do expect to see, you know, significant increases in supply from our existing suppliers in addition to the, the Cells that Tesla is making, so it's, it's both. Um, you know, sometimes I get questions from our cell suppliers of like, "Are we just going to make all the cells ourselves?" And we're like, "No, please make as many as you possibly can and supply them to us." Um, we we have a significant unmet demand uh, in stationary storage. Uh, Mega pack is basically sold out through the end of next year, I believe. Yeah. Um, we have a massive backlog in power wall demand. The demand of power wall versus production is an insane mismatch. Uh, now, part of that problem is also the semiconductor, yeah, the semiconductor issue. Um, so we, we, we use a lot of the same chips in the, in the power wall as we do in the car. So it's like, which one do you want to make, cars or power walls? So we we need to make cars, so therefore power wall production has, has been reduced. Um, uh, but as that semiconductor storage is alleviated, um, then we can um, massively ramp up power wall production. Um, you know, I think we, we have a chance of of hitting an annualized rate of, you know, a million units of power wall next year, uh, maybe, uh, to a sort of on the order of 20,000 a week. Um, but again, dependent on cell supply and uh, semiconductors. Um, but in terms of demand, I think there's probably demand for in excess of a million power walls per year. And and, and, and a, actually a, just a vast amount of mega packs for utilities. Uh, as the world transitions to a sustainable sustainable energy production, solar and wind are intermittent and by their nature really need battery packs um, in order to provide a steady flow of electricity. Um, and when you look at you know, all the utilities in the world, this is a vast amount of batteries that are needed.
Um, that's why, you know, long term we really think, you know, sort of combined Tesla and suppliers need to produce uh, at least a thousand gigawatt hours a year, and maybe two thousand gigawatt hours a year. Okay, great, thank you. And I have a quick question. I know, uh, Elon, you you don't you, you don't think it's meaningful today, but I'd be curious to know, you know, if you have any stats about. Uh, when you you announced a new pricing on a on a SAT moving from 10 ground up front to 199 without the lock-in, I'd be curious to understand, you know, how it uh, affected behavior and if you saw like a massive effect uh, effect in the service. And I'm not thinking about people looking at it as an SSD, but more, you know, to to try the most advanced version of uh, autopilot um, and to uh, uh, and to try it. So in, in the first days you've announced the pricing, have you seen like a, a very significant spike in, a, uh, in, in the tech rate? And can you get, get us, give us a sense of uh, how big it was? Okay, so you're, you're asking like, is the FSD tech rate too expensive, and, and that's why we're doing subscription. Or I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly. No, my question is from the time you announced like the, um, uh, the subscription at uh, the $199 per month. Uh, how, how much did like the tech rate increase? How, like, like the percentage of people who who basically took uh, took the subscription as they bought a new car versus yeah. how it was when they had to pay 10 grand up front. Yeah, this is Zach here. I mean, I think we're still early in understanding how, our, uh, how FSD subscription will unfold, but a couple of data points here. So uh, we took a look at our backlog to see, you know, of customers in our backlog who have ordered FSD, did they cancel, you know, presumably to go to subscription after they take delivery? And the level of cancellations there was not seeing cannibalization there. It's possible that that changes, but that was also part of our pricing strategy at Ninety-nine dollars and one ninety-nine. Um, yeah, I mean, we, it's also part of our pricing strategy at ninety-nine dollars and one ninety-nine. Um, yeah, I mean, we, uh, you know, it's like any given price is going to be wrong, so we'll we'll just adjust it over time um, as as we see, you know, the, the value proposition makes sense to people. So um, we're just really I'm not thinking about this a lot right now. Uh, we need to make full self-driving work. Um, in order for it to be a compelling value proposition. Otherwise, people are, uh, you know, kind of betting on the future. I mean, right, like right now, is it, does it make sense for somebody to, to do an FSD subscription? I think it's debatable. Um, but it, um, once we have uh, full self-driving widely deployed, uh, then the value proposition will be clear. And at that point, uh, I think, Basically, everyone will, will use it, uh, or it be rare, rare, a rare individual who doesn't. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your help, and uh, I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, thanks for all your questions, and we'll speak to you again in three months' time. Have a good day, everyone. All right, thank you. This concludes. All right. Sorry for the lag there. Starlink freaked out a couple times. Oh, hush. They want to play the music after the broadcast ends. But yeah, not too much different from what we got at the sharehold, shareholder deck. Sorry, I'm a little... Eh. Eh, too bright. I wanted to adjust the... Uh, I was overexposed there. <laughs> As DJ said. Um, basically, they didn't have any super meaningful... Uh, data to provide on the FSD subscription. I could almost imagine that conversation going on in there like is should someone subscribe to full self-driving now? And then everyone in the room looked at Elon and was like don't dude, don't say it. Don't say it. And Elon was like uh, it's debatable. Uh, maybe <laughs> you know, maybe people shouldn't, but be better um, once we get the wide release, which I do agree with him. Um, so a better question, there were several questions that people were asking 
it's sad that this is a recurring theme of these earnings calls. People ask questions that have already been answered. But yeah, several times people ask questions that were already directly addressed. Um, and probably the best question I heard with people asking if they expected Cybertruck production to be at the end of this year. And I'm guessing the answer was no, but Tesla did not want to confirm that. <laughs> they were like, let's not announce that the Cybertruck's delayed, but let's just say that the Cybertruck will be produced right after Model Y begins, you know, the ramped production. Um, so they don't know exactly when that is other than later this year. So depending, I guess, on how quickly they can ramp Model Y, that's when Cybertruck production will begin. Not confident enough to say that it's delayed, but also not confident enough to say, yes, it will begin production this year. So they did go into a little bit more detail on the Supercharger network, which I thought was interesting because people were directly asking on this earnings call if Tesla planned to restrict the Supercharger network to specific EVs at first which was my idea because I know that there's a lot of Tesla owners out there that already have to wait in line at superchargers and they are not excited for third-party EVs to have access because that means more weights um, and more and more vehicles tapping into the supercharger network. So it just clogs it up even more than it already is. So superchargers, as they already stand, needed to be ramped up and they needed to be uh, deployed faster. And now you're just going to be adding the rest of the EV fleet to the supercharger network, which is just going to add more of a bottleneck on it. But uh, from what we heard from Elon, it doesn't sound like that's the plan. He did mention that they, they are going to need to make an adapter, but they were thinking of providing um, that adapter uh, to the people in the United States. Because obviously in Asia and Europe, yes, they all have the same connector, so you don't need an adapter in Europe and Asia. You would just have to download the Tesla app and pretty much do exactly what I talked about in my videos, which is you download the app, um, put in your billing info, and say what supercharger you're at and what stall you're at, and then at that stall, um, say, like, provide power to this uh, station, but they will have time constraints. So you won't be able to just plug in and have a standard charge rate for three hours if your car charges slow. They mentioned that if you have a slow-charging EV, then after 20 or 30 minutes, it will either charge you peak rates, or not 20 or 30 minutes, I'm sorry, he, the, some kind of time constraint. They didn't specify what it was. It might be 20 or 30 minutes. It could end up being an hour or something. I hope it's not an hour, but essentially they don't want people sitting around at superchargers for hours and hours clogging them up. So the, the app will directly encourage people to not charge for too long. And I'm guessing the supercharger will do its very best to charge at the highest peak rate that the car can accept. Um, and then all of the billing and all of the charging info um, will be handled on the app if you don't have a Tesla. But interestingly enough, they did not mention that non-Teslas would have higher rates um, my, my suggestion, because I know Tesla fans are not excited about this, was that Tesla only allow it for EV-exclusive brands, meaning if you were Lucid or Rivian or Aptera, those kinds of startup companies could access the supercharger network. I think that would be a good compromise because you could say, hey, we're opening up the supercharger network to non-Teslas. See, we're willing to play nice. But it wouldn't clog up the network and it would actively encourage legacy automakers to kill off their internal combustion engine options. So the Porsche Taycan would not qualify because Porsche still sells gas vehicles. And the Ford Mach-E would not qualify because Ford still sells gas vehicles. So it would actively encourage legacy automakers to not uh, keep gas uh, vehicles around because then their EVs would be a lot better deal. Um, but it would also give a huge advantage to those EV startup companies that need all the help they can get. They don't have uh, a bunch of money from their gas vehicle sales to help um, the sales of, uh, what's it called, uh, their electric vehicles. You know, Ford can uh, lose a bunch of money on their EVs because they're making money on their gas vehicles, whereas an EV startup like Lucid or Rivian, they can't really do that. Um I don't think that would work in Europe legally. Well, in Europe, they're already doing an exclusive charging network, so I'm not exactly sure um, why it wouldn't work. Everything is on apps today. What if I don't want to have a smartphone? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I guess you're screwed. Um, because the Tesla supercharger network is not... And I'm all, I'm honestly fine with this. It, you're probably watching this on something that could install the Tesla app. Um, yeah, I guess live in the woods. Um 
you're gonna you're gonna need a phone for most that most people have phones and if you don't want to have a phone then i don't know why you want an ev <laughs> those those markets of people i don't think overlap too much um, but I think rightfully so, Tesla designed the supercharger network to be very simple and easy, and they, they don't want to put screens and credit card readers on every single stall because that would add to the overall cost of making superchargers, and it would make things far more complicated than just people are on their phones or using their phones anyway. You, most cars have wireless chargers in them and that kind of stuff. Um, Tesla's exclusive network, <laughs> the supercharger network, does not charge third-party EVs in Europe. Um, they're, they're going to change that later this year, but I'm just saying in its current form, only Tesla's can charge there. So if Tesla wanted to open it up to just certain types of brands, I don't, I don't see a legal issue as to why they couldn't do that. But, um, yeah, I, I'm just trying to imagine someone buying an electric vehicle and not having a phone, but, um, Electrify America, for the record, does the exact same thing. Most most third-party EV charging networks, all non-Tesla supercharger networks, pretty much do the app method of you plug in your destination, you plug in the location of the charger, you plug in what stall you're at, and um, you handle the billing from there. Um, yeah, you have a phone. Imagine sideloading the Tesla app onto a car with an Android head unit. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, let's see. Was disappointed that no one really asked about Tesla energy and what future projections are. Well, I can tell you that the main thing is they can't build the batteries fast enough. Mass production is really, really hard and we don't know what we don't know. And we're going to increase orders from suppliers and we're going to do our best to ramp our Tesla energy. But it, yeah, from what I got from the call that I think we should probably expect from future earnings calls is just that Tesla has a very, very difficult time. Uh, having long-term projections because there's so many steps to ramping up production of any product. A Tesla, a Cybertruck, a Powerwall, a Megapack, a, a semi-truck. All of these things are really, really hard to have concrete timelines on because there's all kinds of stages to the process that they don't know how complicated is going to be. Um, but... I'm sure Tesla Energy, they want to ramp it as much as they can, but every battery that goes into power walls goes away from vehicles, so they have to just do the best of their ability to figure out which is more worth it. Um, let's see. what hap Whatever happened to that rumor where the Cybertruck was going to be made first? Yeah, I didn't believe that at all. If you followed me on Twitter, I, I commented that on Im uh, immediately. Um, there was a guy called Troy Tesla, I believe, or Troy something, um, who was suggesting or he heard from a source or a leak or something that the Cybertruck was going to be produced before the Model Y. And I instantly said no, um, just looking at the construction of the factory right now, that does not look likely. Um, and also Rob Maurer, I believe, talked to the exact same source. And the source did not say the Cybertruck would come first, just that the Cybertruck was due to that not due, but the internal timeline for the Cybertruck was to start production in October. Now, just because internally they may have that deadline doesn't mean it's going to happen because it's the same thing with SpaceX. They have all these really ambitious, really aggressive timelines of like, we're going to have the orbital launch by the end of July and we're going to have this by the end of August. And that's not, that's not, <laughs> that doesn't mean it's a guarantee. It just means that's what they're striving for. That's what their target is. That's what they hope happens. So I could believe internally that they're telling themselves, let's get the Cybertruck production done by October. But I'm just looking at the construction facility right now and how the, the walls are not done for the Cybertruck aspect of things. And Model Y definitely has to come first. And they're testing the paint shop for the Model Y. So I don't think the Cybertruck will deliver this year. Um, maybe if a bunch of things go really, really well and the, it ends up being way easier than they thought. There's It's not impossible but it's, I would say don't expect it. I just don't want people going into the, the last half of 2021 with unrealistic expectations. And I think Tesla knows that as well. That's why when someone asked, like, are you going to produce the Cybertruck in 2021? They basically didn't answer the question. They said, like, yeah, we're, we're in the beta stages of Cybertruck and the, the design is done, but we're working on the uh, what the mass production process will look like and they didn't want to really give us any details or timelines is because they don't want to give us uh unrealistic expectations so thank you jamal appreciate it funny thing is charging the entire changing the entire world as well as the course of humanity is pretty freaking difficult if i'm being honest yeah <laughs> makes sense what did they mean by beta phase when it comes to the cybertruck production are these deliverable workable products no typically when you say 
beta phase. That's not uh, deliverable, workable products. We know where the Cybertruck will be mass produced, and we know the the aspect of the factory where you where they'll produce the Cybertruck is not done yet. It doesn't even have a roof uh, complete, and they're still putting steel up where it's going to be. And if we were that close to it, um, let me see if I still have this up here. If we were that close to Cybertruck, uh, it would be listed as construction right here, and it's still listed as in development, which I find bizarre because I thought that part of the factory was under construction. But I guess maybe they don't want to have multiple things listed as construction for Texas, so that's why Model Y is still listed in the construction phase. But I also find it funny that they still put to be determined, as in we haven't decided yet, there is a future product in development. We don't have a name for it. I'm guessing that's the Model 2. Um, but they just keep it on that list for some reason. I have no clue why, but it's still there. Um, I think Orbital is getting close too, but you know, a month, a couple months ago they were saying they were hoping to do, hoping to do the Starship Orbital test by the end of July. Do you think they're going to do the orbital test in the next five days? Because <laughs> I don't. Um, but I don't doubt that there was an internal timeline to hope. The, they were probably hoping six months ago that it would be by the end of July. And they don't know what they don't know. Things are going to be difficult. The FAA gets in there and complicates things. And it's the same thing with the factory. You can only move as quickly as your slowest supplier. Um, so there's... As Elon said, ramping the Cybertruck is going to be fairly difficult because it's a completely different platform and there's all kinds of new structures and manufacturing techniques that have never been done before. So I'm sure they get to bypass a lot of the processes the Model Y goes through, like the paint shop, so you get to skip that. But um, mass producing a bunch of exoskeletons has never been done before with that type of steel. There's never been a vehicle like that built before. So there, there could be unforeseen challenges or things they didn't expect. Um did you hear Elon say nickel base sells for ships and aircraft? Yeah, I heard someone briefly mention that, but I don't think we're we're close to that, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I think everything we thought would be out by this time is delayed. Um, but I'm glad to hear that the 4680s have been tested for reliability and longevity. Um, I believe Drew at one point said that they were testing the 4680s for like an equivalent of a million miles worth of cycle life, and they were doing well which means that these 4680 Teslas, you could literally put a million miles on the car and the degradation would not be terrible. Um, so that's good news. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear that. And uh, basically, I think it means that um, our vehicles are on track for uh, the 4680 and structural pack to be ready at uh, Texas and Berlin. It was a little bit discouraging to me for him to say that they have backup plans. They were like, if something goes wrong with 4680s, we have plans for a 2170 non-structural pack. So I don't want that to happen because that would probably be really, really harsh evidence that um, 4680 is not close to production. Uh, so if they end up using 2170s in Texas or Berlin, that would, I mean, it would be nice that the factories operational and producing cars but it would not look good for the next generation batteries it'd be like okay that probably means model 2 is a lot further away than we thought and the semi and the cyber truck because i'm guessing those vehicles are going to require 4680s a lot more than the model y does model y will will benefit from 4680s but i think vehicles like the cyber truck and the semi are are like they're going to need 4680s i don't think there's a way you could do them with 2170s that would make them acceptable tesla would rather delay them than uh, live with the 2170s but with the fremont made model y they know that they can build uh successful and, and profitable uh, model y's with older cells that people like and it's still a really good selling vehicle so they're probably like okay we have a backup option but i just really hope really hope that doesn't happen um let's see what will the cyber truck changes be side mirrors wipers straight window line <laughs> We didn't get any of that from today's call, but uh, I keep hoping for it every time. I wish people would ask more about that. Um, they don't ask good questions at these things. They still don't. Like, my top question would be windshield wipers. There's a chance that NHTSA could change the laws and let Tesla deliver the Cybertruck without side view mirrors. In fact, they were accepting public comments of that recently. I submitted my public comment. I encourage you guys to as well. Um, so there was a chance 
there, there's still a chance, not a guarantee, that maybe the law changes and the Cybertruck won't need side view mirrors. But uh, something there seems to be no chance of the law changing on, and I have not seen any development in this regard, is uh, delivering a vehicle without side view mirrors. So, uh, sorry, not side view mirrors, windshield wipers. The Cybertruck needs some kind of windshield wipers. I don't care about some kind of. Uh, patent there there's patents floating around that tesla will have this like weird laser technology or or uh air fan technology that will blow the raindrops off or the or the hydro the windshield will have a hydrophobic coating and the rain will just fall off Th that's cool and all and i would love to see development of that but it's still not legal yet so whether or not they actually find a way to mass produce that uh, style cybertruck's gonna need windshield wipers it's it's a requirement um, and rightfully so. Uh, if this thing is supposed to be delivered either end of this year or in the first quarter of next year, that means it's most likely going to be delivered in rainy season, and you're going to want windshield wipers on the thing. Um, Elon did say regulations weren't that big an issue for them. They just need to prove that it works and that it's better than humans. Uh, yeah, wipers don't get around that. <laughs> humans aren't. Humans use windshield wipers, but... I'm still surprised entry Model 3 and Cybertruck cost the same. Yeah, that's, that's, in my opinion, purely because the Cybertruck prices on the website are not accurate to what the Cybertruck will actually cost. Similar to the Model Y, the, the, the current Model Y did not, is not costing anywhere close to what the unveiled prototypes were rumored to cost. You know, they said the standard range Model Y would be $39,000. It never once hit thirty nine k. Um, the standard range Model 3 was promised to be $35,000, and it did hit thirty-five k, but only for like a week, and then they took it off and then did everything with uh, standard range plus, which was most of the time $37,000, and now it's back to $40,000. So it was referring to side view mirrors. Well, yeah, well, right. If you're referring to side view mirrors still right now, uh, I don't know how you can make cameras that are better than a human. A human still uses the cameras or the mirrors, but um, right now it's still a legal requirement. The NHTSA has not updated the law yet, so you can't um, you can't just remove the mirrors and say, oh, we don't need them. Um, I think Cybertrucks will be $10,000 more across the board. I th That would be bad. I really hope that's not the case. That would probably take a ton of people off. Also, keep in mind, uh, there's a misconception floating around about the Cybertruck. A lot of people seem to think that if they reserved one, that locked in their price of the vehicle. You can lock in your price of full self-driving. Like, if you reserved the Cybertruck back when it came out with FSD, then the price of FSD is locked in at 7 k but not the price of the vehicle. If you look into the terms and conditions of the Cybertruck uh, order page, they they can change it. So just because you reserved a Cybertruck at $50,000, they can still ask for more come delivery time. Um, yeah, they'll, they'll honor the FSD price of when you ordered it, but not the, the price of the truck. If they want to, they could... Say actually, the dual motor option sixty thousand dollars. They they can legally do that. Um, will Tesla get this? <laughs> what is the price? Well, well, I'll bring it up right now while we're talking about it. Let me see. I'll be wrapping up the stream here shortly. But I was just looking at the estimated delivery time. Uh, the long range Model Y is already booked out till November, which is crazy. And then performance is seven to ten weeks. So that's why I think they said Giga Texas will be low volume at first. And I know the performance Model Y is low volume, so I think it would make sense. Plus, it's probably going to be expensive to produce those 4680s at first. It'll take time to get the price down. So I figured that they would start it on a higher-priced vehicle like the Model Y Performance, which is $61,000. But anyway, um, if we go down to Cybertruck here, go to the order page, $40,000. So this is actually cheaper than the standard range Model 3 right now because that's $39,990. Um, I'm predicting this option will be removed entirely um, myself. Uh, similar to the standard range Model Y and the uh, standard range Model 3. They're, they're probably going to scrap this option and I, I think it'll probably never come out. Um, they also took reservations for the long range rear wheel drive Model Y. Um, like, they accepted money for those things, and they never made that car. They never delivered it. Um, so, yeah, if you read the uh, terms and conditions of all this, they can change the prices. I don't know if it'll be 10 k higher. That seems pretty crazy. 
But my prediction is maybe around five. It might be like three to five thousand dollars more than they originally thought. Uh, may, I would definitely say ten if the tax credit comes back and it's really high, um, because Tesla's not going to be able to keep up with demand um, of these vehicles. They can't keep up with demand of their t of their vehicles at their current prices. So if there's suddenly a ten thousand dollar tax credit that's available, um, that's trying to tackle a problem that doesn't exist. All, all you do when you lower the price of the vehicle like that is make more people order it. And Tesla already can't keep up with the number of orders they're getting. That's why they're raising the prices on the vehicles. After listening to the earnings call, I don't think it's a I don't think it's that much of a supply chain issue. I mean, there's there are problems with their suppliers holding things up, but the average price of making their car is still dropping. Um, they're still removing parts and they're still finding cheaper ways to build. So if they're if they're lowering the average price to build each vehicle, but every month they keep raising the prices on the Model 3s and Ys, I think that's a demand thing. There's just so many people ordering them and they're like, okay, we got to discourage orders somehow. So we're just going to add money on top of it because then people will agree to pay extra for it. Um, I th yeah, I still think it's a good price. I'm not saying the Cybertruck will be not worth it if the price goes up. It's still a amazing product. I still think it's their coolest vehicle. Um, but I'm just saying there's way too many people still thinking that if they reserve a Cybertruck, that means that the price is locked in and Tesla has to honor that price. That's not true. It's never been true. Uh, there's people that ordered the Model S before it got refreshed. And... Uh, they had to agree to pay like $8,000 more to get the refreshed one. Um, they're still hit by the chip shortage, but based on the vocabulary Elon was talking about and the recoding they used of different chips inside the vehicles and stuff, um, I don't think, I don't think uh, the problem with... They still had record deliveries. They still produced an insane amount of vehicles. So I don't think the problem is uh, suppliers more so than it is they got too much demand. That's what's causing the price to go up, not suppliers. Um Tesla doesn't even show the prices on the Cybertruck in the Canadian website. That's funny. Um, I do prefer side mirrors. You can check many cars that offer both options, side mirror or camera, and check reviews. Always reviewers prefer and recommend the side mirror. Yeah, but people just are comfortable what they used to, and Tesla doesn't do that. You know, Most people would not have been in favor of doing everything on one display like it is on the Model 3 and Y, but then Tesla did it. Everyone got mad and said, that's crazy and it's not safe, and, and then they mass-produced vehicles like that, and uh, people got used to it, and now they're comfortable with it. No one really cares. I think it's the same thing with the side mirrors. People get mad at first and complain, and then after a while they just get comfortable with it, and they have crazy demand for them. So if, you, if that's a deal breaker for you, I'm sure Tesla doesn't care because they're like, okay, great. We got to free up these orders. We got way too many people asking for the Cybertruck. So um, my prediction is they'll start with the tri-motor options because those are more expensive. So they collect more of an upfront uh, gain on those. And then maybe three or four months in, they'll start doing dual motors and then they'll scrap the single motor entirely. But it sounds like that could pretty much all be next year. Why do you think Tesla prices FSD at 10K and makes it impossible to transfer it to a new Tesla vehicle? Do they want everybody to only purchase the subscription? No, I think um, they just don't like the idea that if you buy FSD once, you have it on every Tesla for the rest of your life. Um, that means instead of you buying a $10,000 software package on every single Tesla you buy for the course of your lifetime, you could buy FSD once tied it to your account and just transfer it, transfer it, transfer it for the rest of your life. And um, they make far less money that way. They would rather it be attached to the vehicle because, for one, that preserves the used uh, inventory uh, value. So if they're selling a used vehicle with FSD, they get to charge a lot more for that vehicle even though they didn't have to physically do anything. It's just a, it's a, soft, it's a flip switch on the software side. So the vehicle just suddenly is worth way more because it ships with FSD. So it preserves the resale value of their used vehicles really, really well. And they know that long term, they can make a lot more money off you if they require you to subscribe to it or buy it with every single one of your vehicles moving forward. So I get it's annoying. I would love it if they did let you transfer it. But from a business perspective, I understand it. Like I get they would they simply would make far less money if they let you transfer it. That's all. 
Um, let's see. Tesla is very dyma- dynamic with pricing. They will adapt to purchase patterns. Yeah, if no one's buying it, they'll change the price of it. They can they can do that at any time. Um, if the long range Cybertruck gets to 400 plus mile range, 5K more is justifiable to me. Well, they're saying the tri motor will be 500, but yeah, I mean, I I still think the Cybertruck could be ten thousand dollars more across the board, and it would still smoke the competition in my opinion, just because nothing else is as durable or has as great a specs or the rear wheel steering adaptive air suspension and the the six and a half foot bed and the armored glass like it's just a killer product i think it could be sub- much more expensive than it is and still sell great um yeah they probably don't show the cybertruck price in other countries because it's not coming to other countries for a very very long time we're just going to be lucky to get the cybertruck next year in the united states so how long it'll take to get it to other countries yeah it's it's going to be a while but anyway I appreciate uh, you guys for tuning in and for the Super Chats. Um, I'm sorry there wasn't any amazing, amazing news at today's event, but um, I was happy to watch the live stream with you all, and uh, I'll be getting back to your regularly posted content lately. Uh, uh, Sorry, regularly posted content shortly. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow, and uh, thank you all for